warm up this afternoon. I realize you've been here for a good while already, so I will try to move along expeditiously, but not be rushed. I want to preach and teach on the subject, good news at midnight. Good news at midnight. My 25-year pastoral experience says this. Normally, in most cases, if not all cases, when the phone rings at or near midnight, it is normally not good news. Somebody has died. Somebody's been medevaced to Washington Hospital Center or John Hopkins. Somebody has been in a critical accident, and they don't know if they're going to make it. But Isaiah says, in spite of the fact that it was midnight for the nation of Israel, there is, in fact, good news at midnight. If you can say that with me to know that you're with me, we can keep the gospel train moving. Good news at midnight. Chapters 1 through 39 of Isaiah speak primarily of sin and judgment. But in chapter 40, it is by the grace of God, the dawn of a brand new day. The nation of Israel had grievously and greatly sinned against God. They had an addiction, a propensity towards idolatry. Idolatry is simply this. Anything or anybody that comes before God becomes an idol. Oh, by the way, the job that Jesus gave you, if you start putting the job before Jesus, you begin to idolize your job. The house that God gave you, if you put that house before God, So God says, I'm going to do an ironic thing. Since you have such an addiction to idolatry, I'm going to send you down by Nebuchadnezzar II to captivity in Babylon, which, by the way, is the capital of idolatry, to cure you from your idolatry. It's akin to sending a drug addict to the nearby crack house. It's akin to sending an alcoholic to the nearest ABC store long after he's learned his ABCs to get cured for his alcoholism. God says, I told you that as high as the heavens are above the earth, and I have 55, my ways are not your ways, and they're past your finding out. Sometimes God sends us to the strangest places to get delivered. It was so bad in Psalm 137, we'll help you out when you get time. Read that, please. Psalm 137 says this, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we even wept when we remembered Zion. They that captured us required of us to sing one of us those happy church songs of poor foot. They were making mockery of God, said, where is your God right now? They were down in Babylon in captivity well now for over 50 years. They had got depressed and distraught because they had come to the erroneous conclusion that God had forgotten all about the covenant that he made with Abraham. They thought God had forgotten that they were down in Babylon. Matter of fact, they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They hung their harps in the midst of the willow tree. Down in Charles County in Southern Virginia, we call it a weeping willow tree. It's a sad, dreary, drooping looking tree. Somebody said, we know the tree. It was midnight. In the nation of Israel. The temple in Jerusalem, the city had been destroyed. It would lie in ruin and wreckage. All hope that they'd ever get out of Babylon was destroyed. Has anybody had a midnight experience when the bottom falls out, the sides collapse, everything you touch lately turned to mud? Look like everybody else around you is getting blessed, but you getting left out? It might be a midnight. Your last medical report was not favorable. And my God, something else has gone wrong. The marriage is on the rocks and you need to get help. You feel like you're single and God has forgotten all about you. That things are never going to get better. You might be in a midnight season. But by the grace of God, in the midst of their midnight, matter of fact, chapter 40 starts such a dramatic change from chapters 1 through 39. Many of the scholars are still debating as we speak about the authorship 
One scholar says, Isaiah, as we know him, the prophet, wrote all the 66 chapters. Another scholar said, no, that can't be true because it's so remarkably different. It has to come from a different person. There must be a second Isaiah or even a Deutero Isaiah as in Deuteronomy. Are you tracking with me? They deserve judgment. But God says, look at what he gave here in verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. Tell her that the warfare has accomplished. The war is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned. Point number one. There are at least three voices speaking here in verses 1 through 11. If you track with me, then we'll be on our way. The first voice is the voice of pardon. Has anybody here ever sinned? Has anybody here ever wronged somebody else? Has anybody here ever told a lie since last year? Has any? Has anybody here, don't raise your hand, but raise your heart. Has anybody here ever been guilty of a crime? But he says, you deserve to be punished, but I desire to pardon. Sometimes life experiences make the scriptures, help the scriptures come alive. Are you playing with me? Some 28 years ago, I was an inspiring multi-million dollar life insurance agent. Aspiring. I didn't mind working 70 hours a week because I, not only was I planning on being Mr. Fortune 500, that was too large. I wanted to be Mr. Fortune 50. But in my arrogance, with my little college degree, that caused me to thought for a moment that I knew everything, not really that it was only a BA or BS degree, not realizing that life would teach me the other 24 letters of life, I try in my simpleness to try to tell a seasoned man how to run his business that was doing his business long before I knew what his choice was. I was just moron-like. With my Pierre Benjamin Cardin shoes on and my little Pierre Cardin tie and match the shirt just in like Beacon Jones. Color coordinated, mowing the yard and matching Nike sweatsuits. You couldn't tell me I wasn't on my way. First year in the business check, April came $8,200. Oh my God, I lost my mind. But one year later, the check came in April, $8.02. I lost my mind again in another direction. Let me cut to the moral of the story. I did crazy stuff. <laughs> Ended up departing with a non-favorable dismissal. <laughs> but how many know that sometimes in life, the worst slash best things come together? In one sense, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me, but one guy said, who's the CEO, he said, the company fired me, but what I did not know ten years later, I was fired to my destiny. Had I stayed there, I might not have never gotten to where God wanted me to be. For years, my conduct haunted me because it was sinful and ungodly. And I never got to tell the man that I was sorry for my sin, for what I had done, I can crazily with he and his wife. Not about her, but the business side of it. But last Thursday at Giant at Manatee, on our three, I got to meet the man that I was acting crazy with. And I said, sir, I'm so glad I saw you because I was supposed to be here an hour ago, but I'm glad I was delayed because if I came when I wanted to come, I would have missed this opportunity to make reconciliation. 
And I told him, I said, sir, I'm so sorry. I was young, arrogant, crazy, and foolish. Boy. I was just sinful, disrespectful, and I'm sorry for how I treated you and your wife. He said, Joseph, your record is clear with me. You have been pardoned. I forgave you a long time ago. I'm talking about a voice of pardon. My God from heaven feels like a weight lifted. Feel like a weight was lifted, a burden was lifted. And God says if you felt that weight from a human pardon of forgiveness, magnify that by about 30 million times, you'll get an idea of what spiritual pardon feels like. All of our sins have been forgiven because Jesus paid it all. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Forgiven. Pardon. Some of y'all looking at me like you never had any crazy moments in your life. Come on, take the halos off just for a minute. All of us here, they have said, done, and or thought something that was not pleasing in the sight of God. But like God did for Israel, he said, look here, your iniquity, look that up when you get a minute, it means your wickedness, your sin, your lack of righteousness has been pardoned. Many good governors, even presidents, I believe, to some degree, near the end of their terms, have the authority and the ability to pardon. When you are pardoned, your record is expunged. It is washed, clean, new start. It's good news at midnight. As I floated to my car, feeling light, touching ground every now and then, said, my God, I got home, my wife said, what is wrong with you? Your face is going. I said, honey, I got to tell you, I've been pardoned. This man who had a right to be angry with me 28 years later had a right to just cuss me out of that giant, but I'm glad he did not. He said, you are forgiven. Your record with me is good. Matter of fact, I really desire to be your friend. I said, oh my God, it's good enough to be forgiven, but you want to be my friend? You want to do lunch? You want to stay together after, after all the way that I've done? But even greater than him being a friend, God says, I no longer call you just servant. I call you friend. Comfort ye, comfort ye. Old Testament written in Hebrew, so my curiosity led me to go back to the lexicon and concordance to find out that comfort in the Hebrew was the word narcon. It means he has passion and compassion. He pities our stupidity and our sin to the point that he desires to deliver us. No matter how low, how ungodly, how unrighteous, how wicked the God that you and I serve today. In this modern technological age, some of us sin in cyberspace. You got an app now called Sin App. Not really, but some of them are sinful. <laughs> See? <laughs> Sin App. Dot com. Free downloadable. Israel had an O-M-E complex. Oh, my empire. Well, well. When the king of the empire, Lucius, that sounds close like Lucifer. You know that was by design. And cooking. Only thing about cookies, they crumble. Then to be an inclusive, to get 
14,300,000 folks watching on Wednesday night, and some of them belong to Fort Foot. Because you sure weren't in Bible study on Wednesday, because you had to catch the season finale of the last episode. They wanted to be inclusive and include everybody, so Jamal had to be gay while seeking his father's approval that he said he didn't want, but he really did need it. Lucius Lyon. The music impact. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it was, the music impact. When the king of the empire was diagnosed with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, for my medical folks, a myotrophic lateral sclerosis, where the neurons and nerve systems begin to die, and after a while it's hard to talk, it's hard to speak, then you can't breathe, then you die. He was supposed to die in three years. You know it was not by a mistake that they chose the number three. Because as, as it's doing the show, he that was supposed to die had some kind of metaphorical resurrection. Y'all still with me? But after they found he wasn't going to die, because you know the villain and the star of the show, if he died in the first season, show over. Everybody in the empire was hoping he'd die so they could take over the empire. So they ended up trying to be a hostile takeover. But how many know it's not a good business? Ten minutes after the the company goes public to have a hostile takeover. Israel had an empire complex. But Jesus said, in spite of your empire complex, your iniquity is pardoned. You have received of the Lord's hand double for your sin. Thank God he could handle it. That was not a mathematic doubling. It was a poetic doubling, which means there was a great Price for their sin. Sometimes in our modern, sophisticated age, we don't like to call it sin. We use words like cohabitation, <laughs> premarital suppositions, <laughs> an error in judgment, a mistake, a slip. It's all that, but it's sin. And the wages of sin is Death of one kind or another. But Jesus said, your sins have been parted, they've been forgiven. But even when God forgives sin, there's often still a price and a residue. You drink a fifth of a gallon of liquor a day, God forgive you, but you still might get cirrhosis of liver. But thanks be to God, there is good news at midnight. They should have been cursed, but he's pronouncing comfort. Anybody here ever sinned or been mean, had a nasty, jacked up, cranked up attitude, and a friend or a spouse or a member or somebody, a coworker, had to forgive you for your behavior? Y'all will never come short. Thank God I passed the Fort Foot Baptist Church, the church that never comes up short. They're always spiritually in tune with God. You ain't never told a lie and later got caught. You ain't never had a bad day, woke up mad for no particular reason, not thank God that you woke up. You just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Look like lady the other side. You don't even like you. Walk in an empty room and start an argument. <laughs> it's too hot. 
It's too cold. If you popcorn, you want potato chips. You just are not ever satisfied. But God says, in spite of all of that, look at what he says here. Don't miss this. In, 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 in verse 1, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. God still claims us with all of our stuff. God, Jesus. Parents do an interesting phenomenon. When children are doing less than great things, they say, what's wrong with your child? must come from your side of the family. That's your DNA. But when the child graduates, becomes an eager scout, matriculates through several different universities, make you all proud, look at what our child is doing. Isn't our child on the upward? Look at what God is doing in our offspring. But the good news quickly so you don't miss it. Wherever you find yourself this afternoon at 1241, whatever your dilemma, whatever your issues, whatever your crisis, whatever your storm, whatever your struggle, God gives good news at midnight. No matter how dark, how terrible, how taxing, how frustrated, how distraught, how upset, God gives good news. And sometimes God allows us to experience the midnight so we can appreciate the dawn of his new day. Sometimes God allows us to get so low that nobody can help us but God. Some of our greatest lessons are learned, not at the university, not at Morehouse, Spelman, Morehouse, Howard, Hampton, Harvard, or Yale, but they come from the University of Adversity. They come from the school of hard knocks. When the way that you are today, there can only be one reason why we're there, and that's because of the amazing, infinite grace of God. Do I have a witness up in here today? The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Not only is God showing the voice of pardon, verse 3 through 5, we see the voice of providence or provisions. They said they were making straight the way of the Lord. Does God really need anybody to make a way for him? Or is he not our way maker? In the Old Testament and the New Testament, when the king or high-ranking official was coming, they would go and do like we do in times when a city has been granted the site venue for the Olympics. They paint all the buildings, build new construction, take care of all the potholes, and get everything in order. And when even New Testament, they call it the parousia, they keep saying the king is coming, the king is coming. So they clear the way and make ready the interest of the king. Well, you and I ought to clear anything and anybody, any distractions, any concerns in our life that would prevent Jesus from displaying his full self, prevent us from becoming all we can in Jesus Christ for ourselves. But not only that, we should help clear the way that others may come out of darkness and begin to walk in the marvelous light. Remove any stumbling block. We ought not be a stumbling block, but rather a building block. We ought not be one who's getting in the way, but one who can help others come to see Jesus. Make straight the desert. A highway for our God. Anybody grew up small town with a little small road, one way north, one way south. God says to you and me today and Israel, you are merely a little pathway in the desert, but I'm trying to make you a highway. I, they often use the metaphor of a highway. When you get on a highway like 95, you're going somewhere. Are you praying with me? He said, make straight the desert in a highway for our God. Watch this, Dr. Martin Luther King popularized this statement as only he could. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain shall be brought low. And the crooked made straight. And later he said, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed among all flesh. God's saying when the world throws dirt on you, you can get mad and try to throw dirt back or you can use dirt to fill up the valley. Granddad said, God is the only one who can take a crooked stick and hit a straight lick. The point he was saying that God can use us imperfect human beings to lead somebody to a perfect Christ. 
Please don't ever worship anybody's pastor. Don't worship anybody's bishop. Don't worship anybody's elder or potentate. Because we are frail. I try to share some transparent things with you to be real with you. I can't share everything with you because if I shared everything with you, you might not respect me or like me. But if you shared everything with me, I might not like you either. Because the text says right here, all flesh is but grass. And God says, and flesh is gone. Come on, help me out, Hollywood. You're a rising star, but it's normally relatively a short season. They want young supermodels. Now, you ain't seen no 65-year-old supermodels. Not that 65-year folk are not attractive because one day we're going to be there, God, be willing. But I'm talking about the, the fickleness of Hollywood, the fickleness of fame and fortune. God said, don't get hooked up on any person. Stop trusting in other nations. Stop trusting in any perfect people who are going to pass away like grass and lean on me. Then you see the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. One glad morning, one glad noonday, when this life is over and he gives us verses along the way, we're going to see God, God, Jesus, in all of his glory. Somebody wrote a song and said, one day we shall be a whole him in all of his glory. Right now in these human fleshly bodies, we cannot receive and stay alive seeing God in all his glory. It's like being connected to a high-power electricity wire. When you grab it, it'll destroy you. You remember Moses said on that day, he said, Lord, you say I'm one of your favorite servants. Let me see your glory. He said, Moses, I know you don't mean no harm, but you don't really know what you're asking for. If I show you my full glory, it'll kill you right on the spot. But I tell you what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to give you a glimpse of my glory as my hinder part pass by. And that will hold you till I come. Every now and then I want to realize that God is a God of pardon. You remember old shouting John? When a sophisticated church said, John, you shout too much. John, you dance too much. So they hadn't seen him in church for a while. After they heard old John steal it today, came out to John so far. And John said, see all this land that y'all drove up on. God gave me that. John said, I got horses that I can hook up and plow, and God gave me that. I got children that I never had to go to D.C. jail for, never had to go to the Bible for, never had to go to the graveyard, never had to go to the cemetery. I'll tell you what, if I can't shout in your house, if I can't dance in your house, somebody will hold my mule. Because when I say of the goodness of the Lord, all that God has pardoned me for, his blood has blotted out all of my transgressions. When I think about how God has provided one blessing after another gave me victory over one fall after another. When I think of the goodness of the Lord and all that He's done for me, He is my Jehovah Jireh. He always provides. I fail Him many times, but He never failed me yet. I gotta give Him glory. I gotta say, yeah, He's all right. He's all right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Up the Lord, He heard my cry, pitied my groan. Long as trouble rise, I'm gonna hate God. He gave me good news in my midnight hour. I was down and out, felt like I was being buried, but I really was being planted. Good news at midnight. Over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege to stand by bedside when the doctor said, call in the chaplain, call in the priest, call in the pastor that they may give this person their last rite. That was 2001, but I saw the person that they were praying over at the Kmart. Matter of fact, the doctor said he wasn't going to live long. The doctor's in heaven and the person's still here. I've seen God show up at midnight. I've seen God move when the doctors had closed the curtain, walked out, done all they could do. But when the local physician left, another doctor came in. He had eyes like balls of fire. He had hair like a round one. His name was Dr. Jesus. When you get a glimpse of the glory of God, 
you come to a happy place in life. See, after 25 years, I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm trying to proclaim everything. I ain't trying to out-preach Creflo because I can't afford a $69 million jet. I ain't trying to preach Jake's get ready, get ready, get ready. I ain't trying to be Joel Osteen. I ain't trying to give you some namby-pamby, socialistic, success-driven gospel. Though God does bless us, material success was a sign of God's blessings in the Old Testament, but a sign of God's presence and favor in the New Testament is not about blessing and prosperity, though he gives that. It's about adversity. How we deal with adversity is a sign of who we are in Christ. Anybody can praise God when the month has three paydays. But when there's no payday, and payday came, it was just another day. Inflow, outflow. Your money is always talking, but it's always saying goodbye. I prayed and cried with parents. Junior has thrown a brick through somebody's patio door, and Junior has no job. <laughs> Told him not to leave the car out the driveway until he got back from down south because they need to get an inspection and the car didn't have good brakes. But Junior gonna joy ride anyhow, mess around in a Volkswagen and run it back of somebody's fifty thousand dollar Mercedes. But then the mom and dad kept calling on the name of the Lord. They kept interceding, turned down plate fast in a season of Lent. Plead the blood, I plead, I plead the blood on behalf of my child that has got temporary insanity. And then one Sunday morning, that child came walking down the aisle, aisle, tears dripping down from his eyes. I said, Mama, I'm sorry for acting a total fool. I just feel a jerk, and I wouldn't be mad if you didn't even claim me anymore. But I'm giving my life to Jesus. I, I've seen God move at midnight. He gave a voice, a part of one of the last Hebrew terms, he said, verse 2, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. That phrase is the Hebrew word lab, L-A-B-E. It means God is not just speaking to the mind, though he does speak to the mind because he wants Christians to have intellect. He's more concerned about speaking directly to the heart. The immaterial, invisible part of our soul. He said, Hear me, Israel. Hear me, Fort. But he said, I want to speak to your heart. See, when your heart is for God, you're not hung up on power. You're not a control freak. Because you realize you're not controlling anything. It's God that's in control. Some young pastors get in a whole heap of trouble by making mistakes because their name is on the billboard outside and think they're in charge. There's a way that gets us all in trouble. Some members act like because they've been at the church for a while, it becomes their church. When I first got to Fort Foot back in 1990, we had sophisticated, intellectually endowed members who had matriculated through several different universities. And they had a nice way of telling me that, young boy, all we want you to do is preach, teach, sit down, shut up, we'll take care of everything else. Deacon Seals, they helped me navigate the troubling waters at the port in the early 90s. He said, son, you got a big happy smile on your face. You don't know what you just signed up for. <laughs> Thank you, Deacon Seals, for being one of the pillars who stayed with me through the whole time. Deacon Leroy Williams and Deacon Carson Austin. Really, to get about anything done back then, I had to get authorization. But as time went on, you always keep communicating, but it wasn't so much then about authorization. I would come to the leadership to give information. And after about year seven, I got bold. I said, they got a sale of the day at Home Depot and Lowe's. They got nice, shiny red wheelbarrows on sale. Since y'all just want to push them around, go get you one. (laughs) 
in love. Because <laughs> if a leader don't lead when he should, he does a disservice to the body. But it also is a disservice if he get hung up in some Jesus complex and think that God doesn't speak to anybody but him or her. No, it's going to take all of us. Yes, I'm responsible for everything, but I ain't got to be directly in everything because I'll be in ICU and not be able to come to see you. So, so let me have this quick 30-second pass a moment then I get back to text and we finish in a few minutes. Since God has assigned me the awesome task and privilege to help take care of all of y'all, All of y'all should help take care of me. <laughs> In a godly manner. I ain't asked y'all for $30,000 to get me some gold teethers. <laughs> or $300,000 Bentley. I ain't done that. Don't plan to. If I ever ask you for $69 million to get me a Learjet, so me and the social media can fly to our next ministry menu venue. Please pray for me and call St. Elizabeth to commit me to get me some help because I done lost my mind. Good news at midnight. He gives a voice of pardon. He gives a voice of provision. Lastly, he gives a voice of promise. 60, 11. Look at what he said down there with me. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arms shall rule for him Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Here's a good part. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arm and carry them in his bosom, and he shall greatly lead those that are with him. God promises to be a good shepherd for all of us. Amen? He will feed the flock, not fleece the flock. He will gather the lambs, not gorge the lambs. You know why Jesus, when he picks up a stray sheep, put him on his shoulder? Because it's close to the heart. He can hear the heart of the shepherd. Somebody said a good pastor shepherd will spend so much time around sheep, he or she starts smelling like sheep. Pastor can't always be gone. You can't always pass that 38,000 feet. Somebody said, where's your church? I said, I don't have one. If you don't know, I'm just the under-shepherd. Glad to be. Happy to be. Thank God you have a happy pastor. Ain't mad at none of y'all. And if you're mad at me, I'm glad you didn't tell me. It has been a blessing and a privilege to share with the fort for 25 years. <laughs> Over Jesus. I'm trying to tell you, the psychologists say it is a hazardous occupation. It can be stressful. I have no complaints. As I pray for you, please pray for me. One lady said, you didn't call my family. Check on them. I didn't know they had a problem. <laughs> I ain't leaving on no man. I'm just thanking God that he's a God of pardon. If he hadn't been a God of pardon, I'd never been here today. But guess what? Neither would you. God will provide, be it college tuition, be it mortgage, be it whatever we stand in need of. God is a provider. He's a healer. He gives reconciliation. As I felt so relieved when I got to make peace with somebody that I had wronged, how about you? 
Is there anybody in your circle that you need to go back and apologize to and ask for their forgiveness? I ain't the only one that has some issues along the way. Don't let pride keep you from bringing reconciliation. Because Paul said in Corinthians that we have this ministry of reconciliation. And if somebody has wronged you and time has gone by, when they do come to you, don't act like you've been so perfect. Receive their attempt to confess and repent and tell you that they're sorry. Not none of y'all, but some people have sisters and brothers that they haven't talked to since 1975. Same mom and dad. Some of you have children, and one of those children are not your favorite child, truth real out to be told. It might be because you all are so similar that you always bump heads. But you need to be the spiritual one. Call that child, extend the olive branch. If they hang up on you, keep praying. Try again later. Or if that person comes back to dad, mom, I know what I've done. You might have a flashback and get mad all over, but you ought to get glad all because God. I'm trying to help somebody on a practical basis. You might have called somebody out of their name. Oh, come on, help me somebody before that tongue got sanctified. Some of y'all looking at me like, oh, God. You mean, yeah, that, that's what real Christians do? Some of you got issues with your parents that you want to resolve before Thornton and Johnson Jenkins and Stewart lay them here. They'll be trying to crawl all up in the casket too late. Some of y'all got issues with your own church members in the Holy Ghost sanctified place of Fort Foot. The reason you start coming at 11 o'clock because they go to 7 o'clock. You don't want to be bothered with this. We got to get God's house in order. Somebody going to join the choir and sing in your song. You mean the one that Yolanda Adams wrote is your song? <laughs> See, we got to keep it real. Now, y'all was fine when I was talking about Israel, but now that I'm on your street, y- y'all clamming up on me. I'm almost finished. No, we got to get this thing straight. Some of y'all got classmates that y'all have dissed because they didn't meet your criteria and your fickle standard that's going to change by next week anyway. There's some pastors who are jealous of other pastors. How foolish. We're working for the same king. We competed in nothing sports in high school. We're done with that. We need cooperation. I ain't going to support that ministry because, please, that's so immature. Let's grow. Support every ministry that's God's ministry. That God may be glorified. Receive your good news at midnight. If it's darker than it's ever been before, daybreak must be close by. The closer you get to the eye of the storm, the more tempestuous but once you take that one step of faith and get in the eye of the storm, there's a calmness. I don't know who y'all, but some of y'all Monday through Saturday, y'all just rant and rant. We would not recognize you. No, nobody's spouse called me. You can tell the pastor all I've done is what? No, 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 no. God just dropped it in my spirit. So if it hits you, receive it. And stop ranting and raving like you don't know Jesus. Watch that colorful vocabulary that you express. Dramatic adjectives and dancing participles and adjectives and adverbs and synonyms. And stop that. Go somewhere and call on the name of the Lord so we can get pardoned, get his provision, and seek God's promise. Let us stand. There's an old song that the old saint was saying, get right, church, let's go home. God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Judgment's not going to start at the crack house. 
It's not going to start with the prostitutes. It's not going to start with the drug addicts. Judgment will start in the house of God. Right in the pulpit. God knows this pastor is far from perfect. But the truth be told, the reason many churches are jacked up is because the one who stands and proclaims is jacked up. So please pray for me that I stay focused on Jesus. And I pray for you that you stay focused on Jesus. And together, we'll get a glimpse of the glory of God so we can make a difference. If you're here today and have never met Jesus, you may be in a midnight hour, but he got good news. God loves you. Here's what I've learned quickly. The love of Jesus is greater than any of your sin and situations. The love of Jesus transcends all of our issues. Help me somewhere. In his sickness, in his vision, in his perversion. Jesus, he set a forgiving God. It don't matter how bad, how long, how devious, how ungodly, how sinful, and we confess the love of Jesus comes in our heart. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. Once all of us get a glimpse of how much God really loves us, we'll become radically changed. I'm talking to somebody, I'm going to myself. Will today be your day? You got better issues. Give it to Jesus. He's a healer. You got family trauma. Plead the blood of Jesus for your family. Jesus.